All right. The research on this one was really interesting, guys. We do the one for us, one for them type of mentality. Sure. It feels like this was a one for them for Spielberg in a lot of ways because mm. he felt bad about Temple of Doom. So I wanted to start there with the Spielberg piece of this movie. Okay. Because it seemed like he did like a handshake deal with George Lucas in the 70s. God only knows where they were. We'll, we'll make three of these. We'll do Raiders. We'll do two more. Make a ton of money. It'll go great. And then Temple of Doom. What's your relationship with that movie, Chris? I, you know, it's Spielberg and it's got some great sequences, but I don't, I, I know that it has experienced a critical revival at various points. I don't love it. It was pretty annihilated in the 80s yeah. from a disappointment standpoint and then kind of circled back with a no, no, actually it was good. And now it's kind of veered back the other way. I don't know where it's stand. Where's the stand out show? I think it's not held in super high esteem relative to one and three. Um, I think it's also one of the meanest Spielberg movies, which is an uncommon energy for of his style of filmmaking. And I think that's what bothered him. Yeah. So he decided to go back. So there's this awesome Premier Magazine piece in 1989, which is about as candid as I've seen Spielberg. I'm going to read you guys some good quotes. Mm -hmm. I didn't mail this to you ahead of time because hey, I didn't want to step on the pod. He said in that piece, I wasn't happy with the second film at all. It was too dark, too subterranean, and much too horrific. I thought it out-poltered poltergeist. <laughs> there's not an ounce of my own personal feeling in Temple of Doom. So he was really upset about it. So it, it felt like uh, he really wanted to, um, he be, he said to apologize for the second Lighten one. the mood. I didn't feel like it was, it was that I dark. mean, a guy gets his heart pulled out. Yeah, but that was like the coolest scene in the movie when I was a teenager. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh my God. It was <laughs> authentically was scary. Yeah. yeah. I think um, it's even more so now, I think he has an even more fraught relationship to the movie too, where he feels like it's considered culturally insensitive and he looks back on it as kind of a mistake. But it's an effective movie. This movie is definitely a let's wipe the slate clean and go back to what worked the first time. There's a sense, and you can really feel it in this piece, but just in general, you can look at his filmography that this is kind of the end of the line for him in the 80s and whatever era of filmmaking this was from him. Premier even said The Last Crusade is the last surefire hit from his quiver of blockbusters. It caps off a decade during which the boy who would be king of Hollywood established himself as the most powerful movie maker in history. And this is kind of the exclamation point on whatever that era was. What we don't realize in 1989 is we're heading into this totally fascinating Yeah, it's going to have next two or stage three more errors. Yeah. It's almost like an athlete, right? right? Right. It's like, oh, is this it? Oh, actually, it's not it. There's five more superstar years coming. I didn't know any of this in 1989. How old were you when this movie came out, Chris? Twelve. Yeah. So Yeah, it was just like, cool, Indiana Jones is back. Yeah. Oh, Sean Connors is dead. That's all I knew. We were like, we're in. What day? We're going. It's also, I mean, for as much as he's probably trying to right the ship for Temple of Doom or make up for certain things in Temple of Doom, I think for Spielberg, he had been coming out of this, like, I want to be taken seriously era or phase where yeah. he's doing Color Purple and Empire of the Sun. Pretty heavy movies in a lot of ways. And I think he wanted to make something that was like a pleasure. And to me, this is like, I think Raiders is far and away the best Indiana Jones movies. Yeah. But in a lot of ways, Last Crusade is my favorite or like the most pleasurable one. It's the most fun to watch. I think it's it's got the most humor. It's got the most heart. You know, and it, it, I, I, really, I really enjoy this one. I feel like it indicates where he's going in terms of the big tent action filmmaking too. Like Raiders of the Lost Ark has the truck chase scene and it has a couple of really mm. good, you know, the big boulder. But the action in this movie is much bigger, louder, fire, explosions, the tank. There's so much going on here that is leading towards, you know, War of the Worlds and Minority Report and Catch Me If You Can and these big mm -hmm. top visual movies that he's going to do in the future. There's a little What Do I Do Now with Spielberg after E.T. Like he forms that Amble in his first production company in the mid 80s. Then he does that, the Raiders sequel. People don't like it as much. He does... uh Color Purple in 85 and Empire of the Sun in 87, which are his like two serious movies, but they didn't really feel totally Spielberg-y. And he produces was, Goonies, right? Yeah, and he's, he's, they're making a bunch of stuff with the company. He's involved in these different movies, but you can see like in some of the writing from back then, like he has a quote in this premiere piece where he said, um, I have the right to change my mind five years from now, but that fearlessness toward material interests me. Would I be able to throw myself into something that's not easily recognizable as a Spielberg, Spielberg film? Could I have made Raging Bull the way Marty made Raging Bull? Probably not. But what I attempt to make Raging Bull two years ago, I would have said no. Today, I would say yes, I would. That's the difference. 
So it's almost like the he's mentally at the end of the line with like, I'm tired of being the popcorn guy. Yeah. Guy. What else can I do? But yet this is one of the best popcorn movies of the 80s. Well, so I don't want to step on half-ass internet research, but if we're talking about Spielberg, I think we should mention, and we've talked about this whenever Spielberg, we've done Spielberg rewatchables, is that like he's got his, he's getting his beak wet with a lot of different projects in Hollywood. Like he t he's maybe holding a script. He's thinking about doing this. He's he moves this one on to Scorsese. He moves this one on to whoever. And at the time of Last Crusade, he was working on both Rain Man and Big. Yeah. He was at least like thinking about them. And th that's an amazing sliding doors moment for him to think about like what would have happened if he had been like, what I'm going to do is pivot to like more adult dramas or working in, the, in like a completely different vein. And he kind of sets up this, like, every couple of years, I'll be able to make one of these blockbusters. Yeah, but he he chooses both, right? Like, he yeah. chooses Jurassic Park and Schindler's List. You know, he chooses to make AI and also Minority Report. Like, he's he's basically, like, not deciding to to continue making movies through the eyes of a kid or, or make movies now through the eyes of being a father. Like, that's kind of what Last Crusade is about. And that's what this pivot in his career is about going forward. Because everything that happens in the 80s and the 70s feels like a young guy or a teenager putting his dreams on screen, you know, working yeah. through his emotional details, like figuring out, you know, all of the, the, the dreams he had as a 12 year old when he's playing with figurines and filming them with an eight millimeter camera. And then as he gets older, like, you know, he makes Amistad and he makes Munich and he makes all these really serious historical dramas, but he still wants to have fun. And so he never really makes that pivotal decision and it's funny that like big and rain man big is literally about a kid wanting to grow up and be a man yeah. and rain man is about an older brother teaching a younger brother how to grow up despite the differences between them so it's that's like such an awesome pivot point in yeah. his life i was watching a behind the scenes of this movie and uh when they're shooting the the boat rotor scene where the where he's got the he's got kazim and he's about to run him into the to the engine of the boat and uh they cut and spielberg's like uh Nobody likes working on the water. <laughs> and I was cracking up because it's like everybody laughs and every, it's obviously a Jaws joke, but it's also like he's he's being serious and he's not quite Steven Spielberg the way we think of him yet. Like he's still a right. guy who's like 10, 15 years into his career and he's just joking around about like about a water scene in, in an indie movie. It's It was really funny. He says, so I didn't realize this until I read this piece, but he said he worked for five months on Rain Man. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said... In this premiere piece, I was very upset not to have been able to Rain Man because I wanted to work with Dustin Hoffman ever since I saw The Graduate, blah, blah, blah. But then it says, Spielberg says, although he respects Barry Levinson's movie, quote, I find it to be emotionally very distancing. I think I certainly would have pulled tears out of a rather dry movie. It's like a kind of a borderline shot spot. <laughs> I also like, don't kind really of mad agree with that. I feel yeah, like I it is. Rain Man is emotional. Yeah, when, he yeah. put, when they touch the heads, I think that's about as emotional yeah. as it gets. So... He talks a lot about how he started doing Amblin and he they produced Gremlins, they did Back to the Future, they do Frame Roger Rabbit, The Money Pit, and Amazing Stories. And he said it was the reason he only did two movies in five years. Quote, I was just sitting around making decisions about what films I would let my friends direct. Mm -hmm. You look back at the, at the IMDb, because 93 is like one of the great years of all time. He's Schindler's List and Jurassic in the same year, but... From basically E.T. on, it's a little rockier than I remembered, even though a lot of those movies did well or made a ton of money. But this is probably the best movie he made, the one we're doing now. Like the most critically acclaimed, everybody liked it, made a ton of money. But like in this piece, he's talking his next movie is going to be Richard Dreyfuss and Holly Hunter. It's always. It's always. Yeah. yeah. And he's like, this is it. This is the one. It's like, I that one kind of came away. Not a horrible movie, but maybe his least successful movie in all ways. And like, then he does Hook in 91, and that bombs. Yeah, yeah. And then there's the reset, and then he goes on one of the Hook great is, runs. I mean, I would almost do Hook rewatchables just for the the journalism around Hook. Oh, my God. And, like, the making of it and stuff. All the weird shit that yeah. was going on in the set. Julia's, like, what was she, like, 90 pounds when yeah. she did that movie? Yeah. She's, yeah. like, in the celebrity but, crossfire but, at that But point. one of the reasons why, I think, is because he's producing Back to the Future and Who Framed Roger Rabbit and the Joe Dante movies from that time. I mean, he is putting his hands on Hollywood in such a profound way. Poltergeist, like these movies that just will never die, that are like forever movies. And even though he isn't writing or directing them, they probably don't happen without him. Yeah, and there's yeah. also like his fingerprints are on them. 
you know, like it's, totally tone, filmmaking style, yeah. helping the directors make their movies less insane. He's, he's going know. through a pretty crazy divorce during this stretch too. Amy, Amy Irving. Irving out, traded for uh, Kate Capshaw and some draft picks, <laughs> some swaps. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, I'm in NBA draft book. <laughs> One more quote from this piece. I just want Sean's reaction. Oh, both of your reaction, but I just think Sean will be like, "This, this will make you palpitate." He talks about how he loves the Palma and Scorsese for what he sees as their leaps of courage. And he says, quote, Brian's career has taken the most dramatic turn. He started tapping the great, great playwrights to blend his own visual style into terrific literature. And he says he saw Casualties of War. And he said, a great movie, possibly the most powerful statement yet on Vietnam. And Marty's taking great risks. And then he says, everybody's taking risks but me. Mm-hmm. So he really, he felt this way in 1989 and he was already like, this was the best 15 year run probably any director had had. He talks about this when you get closer to Schindler's List about his kind of fear and interest in telling a story like this and his sense of being not quite ready. We talked about a little bit of Saving mm -hmm. Private Ryan too, where he felt like he had a war epic in him mm. and he had such admiration for the greatest generation and there was like a filmmaking style. I mean, there's a little bit of De Palma actually in Saving Private Ryan when you look back on it too, the sort of like severity, the visceral approach. But those guys are older than him too. Like De Palma was like his big brother in yeah. some ways. And he, you know, he and Lucas obviously went on to be more successful, but they always kind of revered him as like the intellectual of the group. So it makes sense. I mean, and I, you could see how he would be intimidated by those guys, even just in terms of their thematic interests. It's like Scorsese's interested in like the empty core of masculinity and De Palma is like a deviant. Yeah. And Spielberg's like, what? My parents got divorced. And that really, that really broke me up, you know? Like, I'll tell you what, though. I was alone in Arizona. <laughs> the, this movie, Last Crusade, has some great stuff from his life and childhood that I had never understood until I saw The Fablemans. That's like one of the things I'm most excited to talk about with this movie because Last Crusade, you'd be like, oh, the third movie in the Indiana Jones series, this is just like a throwaway blockbuster. No, it's like a core text for Steven Spielberg, which is so interesting yeah. that he's able to do that over and over again, is put all his stuff, his psychological feelings, his ideas about manhood, into these movies that otherwise, as you say, are just great popcorn movies. You don't think CR does that with The Watch? I, I honestly do. It's one of the reasons I revere him as my elder. <laughs> Do you want to talk about that stuff now or when we get to it in the Yeah, movie? I think it's like I had just, I hadn't really thought about this. I probably hadn't seen Last Crusade in five or 10 years. The Fablemans came out at the end of last year. And there's a critical moment at the beginning of that movie where we see a young Steven Spielberg see The Greatest Show on Earth, the movie from the 1950s, the one best picture on the big screen. And that's the movie that changed his mind, that changed his ideas of who he wanted to be, how he wanted to spend his life. And that film has a, a, a dramatic like a uh, train crash sequence that is all organized around a circus. How does this movie open? With, With young Indy train. on yeah. a circus train. You know, this is a movie about a father and a son who have a very complex emotional relationship. One father who's very intellectual and withholding and impressive. Same in The Fablemans. That's exactly how he renders his relationship. The Fablemans is kind of about this weird love affair that Steven Spielberg has with his mother and that his, fa his father has with his mother. This is a movie with some Eskimo brothers where a father and a son have slept with the same woman. Uh, it's a movie that ends with a horizon line shot, just yeah. like The Fablemans, which talks about the horizon line. There are all of these interconnecting moments where he's 15 years into this career. He's considered the wonderkin filmmaker of his generation, and he's still dumping all of this psychology into this entertaining adventure movie. Do you think Steve and his dad stepped in on the same lady? Well, I just think he's in love with his mother. And 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 obviously Steven's father has this complicated relationship with his mother because they split up, but he wanted to be with her. So I don't know. It's just a really cool Rosetta Stone or talisman for everything he thinks about his family. So a lot of like blockbusters nowadays, superhero movies mostly, are really about like the internal mythology of the superhero movies. Like when you watch the Batman or you watch like an Avengers movie or you watch a Marvel or DC movie, you have to like really buy into and want to understand everything about the interrelated characters mm. and like where the movie goes next. And the thing that I love about this is like when they pitched this to Spielberg, he was like not that interested in the grail. Yeah. Like he was like, what we need to do is make the grail a metaphor for this father son relationship. So he's like the reason he's who he is, is he's able to take the, the sort of super text and be like, nobody really cares about the grail anymore. What they care about is their relationship to their dad. Right. And that's what this movie is going to be about. I actually happen to find this to be my favorite Indiana Jones, like quest. Yeah. And MacGuffin. Like, but the fact that Steven Spielberg was like, 
disinterested in the grail is probably what makes this movie work. I do think, though, that that's the secret sauce of Lucas and Spielberg together. Because Lucas, Lucas does, does care, care about, about the that. grail. Yeah. Right, right, right. He is interested yeah. in mythology. He is interested in the MacGuffins. And so you put those two guys together, pretty magical. They had, they started working on this in 84. Lucas had an eight-page treatment called Indiana Jones and the Monkey King. Then got Chris <laughs> Columbus to write this script. And the villains were a Nazi bar owner and the Monkey King. And... I, this is crazy, but the Monkey King, one of his things was he forced Indiana and Dash to play chess with real people and would disintegrate each person who gets captured. <laughs> Indiana battles the undead. He destroys the Monkey King's rod. <laughs> this is from the research. Spielberg and Lucas decided to abandon the Monkey King. That was King a Chris Columbus the, script, right? Yeah, negative yeah. depiction of the African natives. They right. thought maybe this isn't a good idea. And then Spielberg's like, well, what about Indiana's father? Right. And all of a sudden that sends them off and... That could be the metaphor. Everything Chris talked about. But they still needed the father, Connery, who we did on The Untouchables, um, who's smoking hot again as an old guy. He rips off. This is right after The Untouchables, right? Mm -hmm. Untouchables 87, The Presidio, Indy 3, Hunt for Red October, and Russia House in four years. Insane. Pretty sure Chris would just subscribe to a channel that just showed those five movies. <laughs> that would be delightful. <laughs> Connery, 87 to 90. Zaslav, get on it, man. A month. <laughs> Let's just make that a vertical on Put Max. Dr. Pimple Popper during the what day. Is that, is that, that channel is called Great Scott? <laughs> yeah. S-C-O-T? Right. One ping only. <laughs> so he's the, I mean, just adding him at that point in his career to this movie is the secret sauce of this movie. Every scene. Yeah. My biggest criticism in this movie is like, I kind of wish there was like 10 more minutes of just the two of them. I agree. Yeah. Like, a, how about, like, just the, having the, coffee in Venice blimp, again or anything? The blimp coffee that, or the, the the drink they have on the blimp is, like, I, that, that could have been a tour. Yeah, how about a dinner scene? Yeah. yeah, I agree. Like a somber moment? Maybe take out, I don't know, something from the first 25 minutes? They have great chemistry. They obviously respect each other as actors because they really, they're great together. Yeah. Unbelievable as a father and son, which I think is... Sometimes they miss that one when they put the two famous actors where it's like, here's Harrison Ford's dad, Jack Nicholson. It's yeah. like, nah, I don't see that one. <laughs> so but, they think it's like they present this to Connery and they're like, here's the script, it's the layup. You're like, this movie was in, somewhat inspired by James Bond. James Bond's going to play his dad. This is great. And Connery's like, I think in the original version of the movie, it's like a much older, more crotchety, like closest, closer to Marcus Brody yeah. than he is what he is. And Connery's like, no, I will be a stud who roams Europe looking for the grail. <laughs> like, they're I'm like, not doing that. All right, that. Sean, whatever you say, man, just sign on the dotted line. He does do the I have notes thing, which he's famous for. He's yeah. famous for signing on to movies and being like, okay, here's what I think this character is. Yeah. Here and then, my, here then, then here's how you rewrite it, which, you know, a lot of great movie stars do that. But he had a unique power to get what he wanted. So between this and Untouchables and Hunt for Red October... I would say those are three of the biggest movies of the late eighties. Yeah, probably in the top ten. Yeah, um, and this he's was, this essential was the all three. Yeah. And then he moves into the nineties and kind of becomes older Sean Connery. But, yeah, uh, he really needed this to to put a bow in the Sean Connery experience. Harrison Ford, who basically has two superstar primes, mm -hmm. he has that kind of all the way through Blade Runner and Witness and that version. And then he gets a little older. Now we're like dealing with late forties Harrison Ford. And from 88 to 94, Working Girl, Indy 3, Presumed Innocent, which was a giant movie. Yeah. Regarding Henry, which is a hilariously uh, bizarre movie. Not a great movie that yeah, I love. Not a great yeah. movie, but it's, when it's on, you're like, wow, I can't believe they Always made this. Always get stuck in it, yeah. There's this whole stretch of Regarding Henry, Awakenings, all these weird movies they made yeah. where stars were what compromised. What if an asshole became way. nice? Yeah. 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 It is truly. It's Rain Man, Regarding Henry, and Awakenings is all like explosive performers who have been completely neutered yeah. Yeah. because of something going on psychologically with them. Patriot Games in 92, The Fugitive in 93, and Clear and Present Danger in 94. I mean, he's just, this is where if, I mean, we got in a huge argument with Hanks versus Cruz. I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, like, are we sure that this isn't the guy? He might be, these, it depends how much credit you want to give you, him for you Star said Wars. Forever movies? There, there's a there's a handful here, man. Before, if you're saying like top eight most eternal movies, he probably wins. Before we started this, I was at home with my wife and we were watching The Mosquito Coast. And I was like, this is maybe the best actor of the 1980s. Yeah. Like he could yeah. do anything. And even those movies that were saying like The Mosquito Coast regarding Henry, movies that are kind of forgotten, incredibly watchable. There's incredibly a Witness watchable. 2 is another Same one thing. where that 
Yeah, I'm with you. He kind of is Hanks before Hanks. Yeah. There's a, in that same behind the scenes thing, there's a shot of him on the boat going to this, to the shoot for the, for that, for that propeller scene. And he's got his fucking hair slicked back and he's wearing shades. And I was like, this may be <laughs> like the coolest anyone has ever looked ever. You know, he's like on a boat in Venice, just like cruising. I was like, this guy was af- absolutely throwing like 101 at this point in his life. One of the fun things about this movie too is that it almost like shows you how he becomes not just Indiana Jones, but Harrison Ford, you know, like mm. the scar and all that stuff that I'm sure we'll get into, which I yeah. really like too. Yeah. It's like kind of the making of of an icon throughout the movie. As for the A-plus listers, he just grabs a lot of things that made the other A-plus listers, like Costner and him, the two guys you just wouldn't leave alone with your wife or girlfriend for two hours <laughs> yeah. ever. Um, but would also love to like have three beers with. Yeah, but yeah. you would also like, that guy would be fun to go to a ball game with or yeah. just hang out with. Um Kind of the hero that a little bit improbable that they're a hero, but it's believable when they can fight the bad guy. Yeah. But you wouldn't call him like a jacked. It he's never seems Wick. unrealistic. Yeah. 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 He's very credible as a professor and very credible as a guy jumping on a tank, which is hard to pull off. And you think of all these different movies he was in. I mean, The Fugitive is one of the best action movies of all time. That's a movie a lot of people could have been in, but I still feel like if I if I can grab anyone from any point in their careers, I still think he's the best choice. Yeah. Like, same, same thing. Hanks and the Fugitive doesn't work quite as well. Cruise, it just it, it, the Cruise stuff overpowers it. Costner, maybe. There, there's a couple overlap movies with him and Costner. Like Cruise, uh, the, uh, Harrison definitely could have been in No Way Out. He could play the Russian. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think Costner could have been in a couple of the the Ford movies. I think Costner could have been Indiana Jones if he was born ten years yeah. earlier. Yeah. So yeah. They're, they're probably the most on each other's corner. But the when you throw in Star Wars and Raiders, like nobody, that's the fucking trump card of all time. I think they both have, um, like regular guy athleticism. Yeah, they don't seem yeah. like they were, like raised in a lab to be a actor. Right. Like they were like guys who were carpenters or you know minor league ball worked, players. Worked, yeah. Worked real jobs, played sports. Yeah. And then we're like, I guess I'll give acting a shot. You know. He's also, I would say, the number one overall draft pick of if you were playing the game, if you were hanging out with a group of people and somebody was like, I fucking hate so and so. If the, if you're hanging out with anybody, yeah. I don't care what age group you were, and somebody was like, you know, I fucking hate Harrison Ford. You, and people would be like, yeah. what? It's like you, you'd be like, did you get hit like by a, a baseball? Yeah. Like, what happened? But did he you, have sex with your mom? Like, yeah. what did he do? Is he your dad? There'd have to be some sort of story. Do you think anyone has ever said that out loud? I fucking hate Harrison Ford. As a person, you would have a to be like person. Indiana Jones and Star Wars sucks, and it would just be like, why do you watch movies? Then I would do like a but even then you, tape. you could maybe you'd be into regarding Henry. You know, like he's got something for I you, know. even if you hate Han Solo. I would be so interested if somebody said that. I would just be like, why? Yeah. What did he do? I don't <laughs> explain it. I've never heard this take before. So it's all time. Is he in QAnon? Like, what, what did I miss? <laughs> just wait till the end of the podcast when we go to Craig and Craig's like, I gotta, I gotta say, guys, I fucking hate our support. <laughs> yeah. Never got know, it. The Bradley Beal of Craig, 80s yeah. acting. <laughs> he has, I and mean, his, the last 20 years for him is kind of funny because he, there are times when it feels like he's trying to hold on to it and other times where he's like, I'll play Branch Ricky. Sure, you got it. Yeah. You know, like he, right. sometimes he knows that he's the old guy and other times, as we know, he's he's Indiana Jones once more. But the whole point of this new movie is like, this is the end of Indiana Jones. I think his, his, his career, such as it was, was like in a pretty, you know, he was heading towards that, that, that sort of darker place. And I think the fact that Hollywood is now like, Anything that was relevant 30 years ago, we will remake, has benefited him to some extent. Yeah, it's called him back. Because he did Star Wars, he did Force Awakens, he did Blade Runner, and he did this. One of my favorite Harrison Ford moments of the last 10 years was when he showed up on the David Blaine special on ABC. Unbelievable. And he was just absolutely marveling at David Blaine's close-up magic. You know what I mean? That was one of the best specials. Yeah. That was one of the best TV specials of all time. I feel like that was the last time broadcast television really mattered. (laughs) Who was the one? Jamie Foxx? Who was the one that just... Jamie Foxx with mind. his daughter, and like he would touch Jamie Foxx's daughter's <laughs> forehead, and Jamie Foxx would feel it. Yeah, and they both just started freaking out. Then there's like Kanye and Woody Harrelson amazing. are hanging out, and yeah. and David Blaine is like putting an ice pick through his hand, and it's like, why are Kanye and Woody Harrelson together? <laughs> why hasn't why isn't that on once every four I months? Don't know. Okay, so I just wanted to put this in the context of 1989, which. 
is a time when we felt like movies were going the wrong way. Spielberg even says that in this premiere, premiere magazine. Piece. I know that I did when I was 12. I was <laughs> in 12, you were like, cool. Walking up to my, is there popcorn? <laughs> guys in my class and being like, how are you feeling about the state of film? Can you guys believe driving Miss Daisy? What a piece of crap. <laughs> Where are you going? <laughs> Why'd you pick Wait, me come last? Back. <laughs> he said, uh, in premiere, he said about 1988, in my opinion, it has been the worst calendar year for movies in a decade. But I'm not going to sit here and tell you which ones I didn't like because a lot of them were made by my friends. Wait, Spielberg said that? Spielberg said that. Wow. Because a lot of them oh were made God. by my friends. He would, that's something you just would never hear nowadays. So I look at, I felt this way a little bit in 89 because it just felt like we were heading toward this weird sequel, you know, just kind of ostentatious, big, mm -hmm. loud popcorn over the top. Little did we know. I mean, Whoa. that is what happened and it never stopped. <laughs> I look at the fifteen move, the top fifteen from that year, and Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade was second at almost two hundred million dollars. Batman was first. We mm. did Batman already. Dead Poet Society was third. We did that one. Lethal Weapon two, pretty good movie. Look who's talking. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Back to the Future Part two. Ghostbusters two. Driving Miss Daisy. Parenthood. When Harry Met Sally, The War of the Roses, The Little Mermaid, Steel Magnolias, and Christmas Vacation. So we have five sequels in there. But we also have some really interesting movies. I mean, you could argue When Harry Met Sally created the modern rom-com. I think War of the Roses is awesome. Like, we're definitely doing that on the rewatchables at some point. Um, Parenthood is a really fun Ron Howard movie that we've done on this. We've done 10 of these movies. I think if you want to see what's really good about this year, you have to go to Best we Original Screenplay. That's where you have When Harry Met Sally, Sex, Lies, and Videotape, Do the Right Thing, yes. Crimes and Misdemeanors, Dead Poet Society. Well, that's the funny thing about 89 is there's this whole indie thing starting yeah. and nobody sees it yet. And then we move into the next decade and all the stuff Spielberg's talking about, how movies, what's going on. And also, as we've talked about many times, there's this whole culture talking about movies that just start to feel different. So it's an important year and I actually feel better about it than I think I felt at the time. But I'll just tell you this, when this movie came out, I saw it with Jim Grady. I remember where we saw it. It was uh, it was one of those. I think we were at the the goddamn the White Plains Mall mm -hmm. on like a the Monday after it came out. We were my buddy Jim Grady, the number one Harrison Ford fan of all time. Yeah, would take a bullet for him. And we were just like, when are we going? What day? I can't believe he's doing it. I can't believe it's Sean Connery. Like, we just couldn't believe it. It was totally satisfying. Oh, I was going to say, did he it love just, it? Oh, it was just a W. We were like, wow, this is great. And if you do, you feel like you've watched this one a lot over the years. Not nearly as many times as Raiders. Okay. Yeah, same. I, if you're going to criticize this movie, it would be that it's a little Raiders karaoke-ish. Like you have, oh, here's the scene with the rats. And yeah. oh, here's a chase scene. And, you know, they're, they're kind of playing the hits. That's why Ebert's review of this. So there was a $48 million budget made $472.2 million. Ten times multiple. Not bad. Not, not awful. It was what? it made four hundred and fifty million worldwide and was the number one movie around the world that year. Won the Oscar for best sound effects editing, had a couple other nominations. Ebert, three and a half stars. He said when Raiders appeared, it defined a new energy level for adventure movies. It was a delirious breakthrough. I think I agree with that. Delirious breakthrough is nice. Mm-hmm. That would have been a good name for this podcast. <laughs> I don't think there was, was no catchy. way, for, no way for Spielberg to top himself, and perhaps it is just as well that Last Crusade will indeed be Indy's last film. Lol. It would be too sad to see the series grow old and thin like the James Bond movies. <laughs> then he says, "Raiders now more than ever seems a turning point in the cinema of escapist entertainment, and there was really no way Spielberg could make it new all over again. What he's done is take many of the same elements, apply all of his craft and sense of fun." to make them work yet once again, and they do. I think that's fair. Did you guys happen to watch the Siskel and Ebert episode for Raiders of the Lost? I did I, I wish I had. Last Crusade. So what do you say? Banger episode. I watched the whole thing start to finish. Here's all, what was also covered. Miracle Mile, quality film. Oh, yeah, the Anthony, Anthony Edwards, Edwards movie. Yeah, my guy. Uh, Clint Eastwood's Pink Cadillac <laughs> and Roadhouse. <laughs> wow. Did they like Roadhouse? What a week. They, two thumbs down for Roadhouse. Oh, uh, uh, that's awful. I think thumbs down, thumbs up for Miracle Mile, two thumbs up for, or two thumbs down for Pink Cadillac. And Siskel gave Last Crusade thumbs down. Wow. And he gave it thumbs down in part because of what you just said, which was that this is a little bit of karaoke. And he's like, sure, is it fun to see Sean Connery? It is fun to see Sean Connery, but we've kind of seen this movie before and I'm bored. Now, Siskel, you know, 
he would do that from time to time. But uh, in retrospect, that's a bold take. <laughs> Can you imagine Cisco reviewing Fast Ten? Yeah, I mean, he would he would have quit <laughs> a decade ago. He wouldn't have made it through like the two thousands. His eyes would have yeah. just fallen out of his skull. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, those were the stakes in the eighties. Like, even if you made the third sequel of a movie and it felt a little like the first movie people were like whoa yeah he felt frustrated by what was happening that you were talking about in the box office I understand what he's saying but you, the, these movies were sort of envisioned to be a series like they were they, right. they were an homage to movies that they would see like on a some weekly yeah, basis serials yeah. yeah so I think some of that is is kind of in the in the DNA of the movies themselves. Yeah, I agree. I mean, they're they're like Sunday morning cartoons in some ways, and they're yeah, inspired by happens. comic there's books. There's a prelude, and, and then there's like the the university, and then there's going to be a chase, and then there's this. One thing I noticed from '89, and this was something we definitely felt because there was a couple movies we didn't mention in the top fifteen, but this was definitely the sequel. Let's repeat what we were doing before. And Last Crusade is the best version of it. So was Lethal Weapon two. Ghostbusters two, not as much. Back to the Future Part Two was that the one when he gets the he's betting on sports that might yes. have started me gambling. <laughs> Let me give that a thumbs up. Wait a second, we need we, we need to unpack that. Uh, well, we'll do what? it on the <laughs> Part Two. <laughs> no, that might have been that and the Patriots going one in fifteen in nineteen ninety were the two things that pushed me gambling. But did some did a future Fifth. you come to the pre, to, oh my to god the pre, did, present past and give you a book with the you results? Come and start talking I would have about done, same game done so much Is better. That how you I would have been doing so much better. All of the success, Bill. <laughs> Yes. Did you get what is the name of the like sports podcasting. almanac that yeah. give yeah. the Biffs gives him? Sports columns. <laughs> Christmas Vacation was the best Christmas movie, but then it starts getting a little dark. Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. Not a good movie. Karate Kid Part 3. Eh, has some moments. Naked Gun 2. Has some moments. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, probably 4. Something that, like that. Is that Dream Warriors? Friday the 13th, part eight. Which one's that? Halloween five. Police Academy six. Uh, six is good. Um, that is six. Hellraiser two. <laughs> and we that also- Citizens on Patrol? Moscow? And I think another 48 hours was in 89 as well. Oh, yeah. So it was the, it, there was a sense like, wait, are we running out of ideas here? And then all of a sudden the indie revolution happens. And guess what? We hadn't run out of ideas. Right. Police Academy six was City Under Siege. Oh. Definitely seen that one. Okay. I was attracted to Leslie Easterbrook for like five Police Academy movies. I don't know when it was. You weaned, don't say. But yeah, the first few. She was Mahoney? Would, no, that's Gutenberg. She was the, the sex pot. What officer. was her character's I name? I forget what her name was. Callahan. Callahan. That's right. Like Callahan. For five. Was Please. Callahan related to Tommy Callahan from Tommy Boy? Do you I don't know? Think so. Was that not an extended universe? I don't think it was universe? the extended, yeah, extended Police Academy universe. I see. I saw at least three Police Academy movies in the theater, in case you guys were wondering. Um, and both weekend at Bernie's one and two, uh, two is abominable. Yeah. I, I don't think I saw any of them, but I watched all of them on repeat throughout my childhood. I don't know. I miss those funny franchises like that. I don't feel like, like would naked gun even work now? Like I tried to watch airplane with my son. We were just this. saying that because like, I think cause, uh, we were talking about like satire movies like that. It's like spoofs. Like you don't, there's no spoofs. And there's anymore. not the, nobody's done one for superheroes really probably cause it's too expensive. Oh, that's interesting. And there's no other kinds of movies to satirize at this point. I tried to get Ben to watch Airplane with me in like 20 minutes and he's like, this sucks. <laughs> that's so funny because I feel like that one holds <laughs> up. A little Cisco. <laughs> I watched it during the pandemic and I was like, well, this is still a five-star movie. I, I had the great time I think it's it. fucking unbelievable. It's so funny. Yeah. Did you, have you shown Ben Kentucky Fried Movie? <laughs> nah, I think that's probably too dated. <laughs> <laughs> or too... Is what? he too young? <laughs> too yeah, maybe, maybe too young for yeah. that too. Most rewatchable scenes. I just wrote down Young River Phoenix. Yes. God damn. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> He's great. He kicks ass. He's perfect. This. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a mini movie star movie for him for like 15 minutes. It's great. You would have liked to have just seen this movie where he continues to figure out that he wants to be a swashbuckling archaeologist. Yeah. That would have been really fun. He's got fun. this annoying absentee dad. Yeah. We talked about who Harrison Ford and the people he borrowed pieces from and who was the next Harrison. It was probably River Phoenix if he doesn't get fucked up by all these different things because he had, he was handsome. He was, he could have been believable as a professor. He could have been believable as the tough guy. Mm -hmm. There was something, I don't know, human about him, approachable. Yeah, people say that about Leonardo DiCaprio, right? That in a way, he kind of right. moved into a position that River Phoenix had yeah. occupied after River passed. 
Harrison Ford was on the set when they were shooting this. And he did a lot of stuff with River to like do his gestures and his mannerisms mm. to like make it so that the indies matched. Really cool. Yeah, there's like he does that exaggerated kind of slapsticky. I'm in trouble, but mm -hmm. he really does a good job. Yeah, it's why I watch Mosquito Coast because they work together at Mosquito Coast, and the reason why Ford kind of hand picked him in a lot of ways to Spielberg is because he was like, I worked with this kid. This yeah. kid, this kid is the real deal. We get a little train hop, House of Reptiles. We get an elephant. We get a lion. We get a magic caboose. Coronado Crucifix. It's just a really good... It's about as good as you're going to open an action Apex movie. Mountain for crucifixes? Probably not, right? It's, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, I, is, is that the top of... Like, you're, you're saying the, the crucifixion of Jesus it's, Christ? No, well, I mean, like, for the cross of Coronado, probably Apex Mountain for crosses from Coronado, you okay. know? But even more so than <laughs> the power of Christ compels you and the that's exorcist. Right. That's a, that's a good one. Next one I have is the rat in the snake cave into the wooden boat chase. Finding the brother's tomb in Venice. Yeah. Venice. That whole, yeah. yeah. Makes marks also, the spot. They're going through yeah. all that stuff. Indy finds his dad. Don't mm -hmm. call me junior. We immediately set that up. But more importantly, we get the Elsa betrayal. When do you want to do Elsa's betrayal? To do it right now. I'm doing a rewatchable scene. Is this how you taught? You were taught don't trust women, Chris Ryan, age 12. <laughs> Just be careful. This, this little blonde lassie with an Irish accent, don't trust it. I was taught it. maybe not to, to trust Austrian women in the 40s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was 38, in yeah, fairness. Okay. It was a little early. I think I think the rumblings were out on the okay. street. <laughs> How do you feel about Irish actress playing an Australian, uh, Austrian? I had no idea until, honestly, like l very late in life that she was not Austrian. Okay. So, Are you at the end of your life? No. <laughs> later in life did I not know. I didn't know that Alison Duty was Irish. You know, it's funny. We've done two movies, like out of the last three, where a beautiful woman betrayed our hero. What do you think that our great filmmakers are trying to tell us? About? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'm going to say coincidence. Uh, I have to tell you something. The floor's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> I have that scene. We got rotating fireplaces and secret stairwells and a motorcycle chase. I love rotating fireplaces. I love it. It's yeah. great. I also like when never our, not worked our, our heroes are tied to a chair and they're not facing each other. Mm. And so they they can make a lot of jokes facing in the opposite direction. Yeah. That's great stuff. Sierra, you feel like you could get out of rope like that? I had that as pick and nits. We could do I it have now. Pretty, uh, pretty thin wrists. So yeah, I do. <laughs> you feel like you get through yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> I've thought about this before. <laughs> like whenever you get like a wristband at like a show or something like that, I can always just pop that off. The bad guys wow. just never tight, tighten it enough with yeah. the rope and also there's always a lighter or a switchblade right there yeah you know? maybe check the pockets for lighters you took you spent this much time tying them up yeah um you could also like tip the chair over do that thing where now you're on your side and you have you know this. all of these movies and all of the james bond movies have the scott evil problem where in austin powers scott asks his father dr evil just yeah. give me a gun i'll go shoot him in the head <laughs> right now him. he's right we'll there do it together you know it's just like there's always somebody who's like we need we may need them alive at some point <laughs> right. yeah scott daddy's working <laughs> um we did the austin powers right yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's and we great. did two for rewatchables 99 yeah when are we doing three Gold member? Three's good. Two's my favorite, though. You're more of a love guru guy. That's right. <laughs> I have a couple more rewatchables. Indy's dad gets kidnapped in the tank. We get a tank fight. We get the going toward a cliff, about, yeah. which is, I think, who did the first, this thing's headed toward a cliff and everybody's about to fall off and our hero, did I mean, he fall off or probably not? Buster probably Buster Keaton. Probably silent films, yeah. yeah. Fast and Furious, I think, has ripped this scene it's either, off It's either times. Buster Keaton or Fast and Furious. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this is after Indy. <laughs> I think they've ripped this off three different movies where the cars are going yeah. toward and it's like, oh my God. Yeah. I just saw a movie, I'm not going to say what movie that has a version of this that is fucking awesome. You'll see. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oppenheimer? Uh, it's Barbie. Yeah. <laughs> Barbie. Henry gets shot. I have basically the ending, you could put the whole ending in, but Henry getting shot and we get the, the healing power of the grail is the only thing that could save him now. Mm. Always good. I like when the the object of the whole movie becomes then yeah. a life saving device. Is always fun. Indy goes to get the Grail. Does the kneel before the God? Only in the footsteps of God will we proceed. And then the leap of faith. Love that. Kind of like the process with Sam Hinkie. <laughs> Did you feel like you, you were on a forward. forward perspective bridge? <laughs> yeah. What are we? What are we on now? You would leap forward. I think we. I think we, like James Harden. We've drank from the wrong cup. <laughs> no, I think you're trapped in the tomb <laughs> right now the with the knight. Who's the knight in this case? Is it Embiid or is it Maury? 
<laughs> it's probably Tobias Harris. <laughs> I, just a short, but Nazi stooge drinking the wrong grail is yeah. just great. Yeah. Like, yeah, drink that yeah. one. Drink that one, Nazi stooge. Yeah. Oh, oh, he's getting old. <laughs> and then uh, Elsa falling to her death. I can reach it. And then the dad says, Indiana, let it go. Yeah. Elsa never really believed in the grail. She thought she found a prize. <laughs> what did you find? Illumination. <laughs> great ending. Yeah. This movie's good. It is good. Yeah. You're talking yourself into it. No, oh, man, I've been in the whole time. I just, the last 20 minutes are, first 15, last 20, I think are great. I have. And then in the middle, I think you could have probably taken 10 minutes Oh, I see. I think, I think the castle stuff is great with them, with the, the that's basically like the, the haunted house part of, mm. of the movie that I really like. And yeah, I'm surprised you don't have the blimp in there, you know? Put the blimp in? Definitely. The, the, the throwing the, the guy yeah, over. The from the blimp and him landing on the luggage is an incredible sight yeah. gag. Really funny. And then their escape where, you know, Professor Jones accidentally shoots the tail wing off with his machine and he's gun. he's like, oh no, they got they us. They got us. <laughs> and that's an amazing scene. So I had, not to jump ahead, but I had some of that in what stage the worst. Okay. I just felt like the... The effects, you mean? The effects just weren't there yet in 1989. Yeah. It just yeah. felt like two guys in a sound stage on Sunset Hour in an old plane. Sometimes I'm willing to forgive that stuff. You know, they yeah, did the best it. they could. I still think it looks better it. than a lot of the crap we see today. What do you got for most rewatchable CR? <sighs> I'm probably going to go with um, Finding the Brother's Tomb. I really enjoy that with like breaking through the floor, the mm -hmm. X marks the spot, doing all the stuff with the window and then, you know, like her being like, what's this one? And he's like, the Ark of the Covenant. She's like, are you sure? He's like, Pretty sure. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. It's just kind of guy all the indie stuff that you want right in one scene. And I just think that's such a neat I scene. I agree. That's my favorite scene sequence as well. I feel like there could have been more of these, like the whole thing where Spielberg's like, I don't know. We keep coming back to the well. It's like I feel like you could have pumped these out every two years. This is that was that was my hottest take. Was just like why you do why, that now? Why, I just there could be 15 of these. Like I there's like enough ideas of like, what if we made him do this? Or what mm -hmm. if he was looking for that? And I was like, I don't know. In the long scheme of things, like, did you look back? And you're like, I could have, I could have done eight more indie movies. Yeah, like he could have gone to Egypt and found somebody's tomb. Yeah, I don't. You, you still... want to come up with some more ideas here? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. no, that's it. That's all. We could have gone to Canada and found the Vancouver <laughs> Canada, Grizzly. The first time the the very wall of China. Like there could have just been like a bunch of. Yeah. There, there's a lot. Just have him do the Seven Wonders. I think that these movies are pretty hard on Harrison Ford's body. Yes. So well, that was an issue. Because he on doing all the stunts. Yeah. I have for most rewatch, but I really, I really like the River Phoenix part. Yeah, that's, that is really good. Like if I'm flipping channels and that movie's about to start, I'm like, ah, River Phoenix. Part. Yeah. Well, they don't, I, I'm sure you have this in, in part of the research, but I think they actually could have even improved it a little bit more if they just let us know that that was supposed to be Marion's dad. You know, the, the idea that that was supposed to be Abner Ravenwood, is that? Marion's last name. Yeah. And that he was Indy's real mentor, the father who wasn't, you know, who was there for him. That's why he wears the hat. That's why he's got the bull whip. That's why he's got all the stuff. And that he went into this life of adventuring archaeology instead of professorial archaeology would have tied the bow a little bit more on that story. But it's fun as it is. I mean, it still really works. But just reading that that was their intent actually got me more excited. What stage the best? I like the idea of Holy Grail protectors. Yeah. The Secret Order of the Cruciform Sword. That's mm -hmm. right. Basically, the next Good idea. Templar, right? That's one where Lucas was like, it's like 1230 at night. And they're on their seventh bottle of Pinot Noir. He's like, what about what that? Are you, where are you at on the grail? Are you a right. big grail guy? I'm, thank you for bringing this up. I have a lot of thoughts. I'd like to hear Sean's thoughts. <laughs> this is, the whole story is just absolute horseshit. Oh, come on. And just what are we talking? So this is the cup, the chalice that Jesus Christ, the Savior, he drank from at the Last Supper. At the Last Supper. <laughs> And because he drank from it... No, and then they catch his blood at the crucifixion. And that would lead to eternal life and youth for whomever <laughs> drinks from the cup. Uh -huh. You're doing picking nits on Christianity? You're I a lapsed Catholic. On, on, on the Holy Grail. <laughs> I mean, not on Christianity. I'm, I'm not a practicing Christian. I'm not making any judgments in that respect. The, gr the mythology of the Grail, I say no. No, thank you, sir. It's like, honestly, probably one of the bedrocks of like Western storytelling is the Grail myth. <laughs> Well, and, you've, you're, you fools <laughs> fell for it. I don't know what to say. I had a big... I feel like Molly Quarum. What do you think, Perk? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Carry on! I don't like the Holy Grail at all. Um, 
I don't even know what to say about Sean's <laughs> blasphemy, but <laughs> but it's okay. So okay, I had this whole phase when I was a kid because the Philadelphia Art Museum <laughs> has a big collection of crucifixion art and uh-huh. also uh, medieval armor. Mm-hmm. So I got really into King Arthur. Grail was a big thing for King Arthur. He sent those guys out to look for it. Yeah, and I just got really obsessed with it. What happened to all those guys he sent out? Well, I mean, you dead. Know, some of them they died <laughs> questing for something that doesn't exist. That but doesn't they were grant going powers. through like a like plague years there. Well, like, it they cleaned needed a, to it cleaned a bullet wound pretty fast. I, that was yes. pretty cool. In the mythology of this film, it works wonderfully. But this is so. Just does a Sean movie. Connery have eternal life? Though I had this later for no, probably. We got, we'll question. talk we'll about that. It, yeah. Okay. yeah. We have Bill Grail, yay, nay. Yeah, I you, like it. Did you ever okay. have a King Arthur phase or a Grail phase or anything? I never had a phase, but I like the I like the concept. You, the I idea. know it's there. Yeah, yeah. To me, it just kind of transformed into the uh, NBA title. <laughs> the like Larry Jokic, Larry Ryan Ryan Trophy. Trophy. Yeah, Lo- Jokic wins that. It's similar. He gets superpowers. He for does it. get eternal get youth. legacy power. Yeah. He's remembered at this yeah. age. Dirk forever. Nowitzki, 2011, Holy yeah. Grail. It's Reggie Jackson, 2023. Yeah. <laughs> and also Larry O'Brien, also crucified, as I recall. That's, that's why. Yeah. That's why he got the trophy. There was a thing on uh, one of the weird NBA Instagram things that I follow. <laughs> That had the 1976 championship celebration from the Celtics when the NBA trophy was still the Stanley Cup. It looked like the Stanley Cup. Mm -hmm. Uh And then the next year with the Blazers, when they won, it turned into what the trophy looks like now. And you see this cup and you're like, that's amazing. Why did they get rid of that thing? Hmm. Apparently it's in the Hall of Fame. When I'm in charge of the NBA, the cup comes back. (laughs) We get rid of the Larry. I don't know the origins of the Stanley Cup. Is it somehow related to... Lord Stanley, but like Christian. Oh, I don't know. Artifacts? I think he's just he just wanted to talk more about the NBA. I don't yeah. think it was like <laughs> this is actually. The the I thought you were going to close the loop on that. No, <laughs> no, okay, all right. But it felt more holy graily. I guess is okay. my point. Right. It was more like a cup you could drink out of. More what stage the best? Um, we've said this, and when we did Raiders, the Nazis as villains, you just don't get any better for a movie villain. The, it's the peak, and we got the big dog in this one. Yeah. Yes, we do. We do. We get Connery. (laughs) (laughs) We get Connery saying, Nazis, I hate these guys. Yeah. It's great stuff. Indy and the dad both sleeping with Elsa. I know we talked about that. You said, what's age the best? Well, just that they went for it in 1989. (laughs) It was like fucking ballsy. I'm actually surprised they did that. I appreciated it. Yeah. So wow. uh, Sam Levinson directed this one. (laughs) Harrison Ford's 46. Sean Connery, only 12 years older. 58 at the time of making this movie. Allison Duty, 21 years old. Man. Yeah. Okay. Did a lot, that age a lot the of Larry O'Brien trophies <laughs> passed between the three of them. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of championships. The quest for the grail is not archaeology. It's a race against evil. If it's captured by the Nazis, the armies of darkness will march all over the face of the earth. I had that in what stage the best. Great, great setup for a conflict. We sure about that? The armies of darkness? What's going on with you? I don't know. I'm, I'm the grail. Are we, are we sure it's good? I don't know. I'm just not sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a short scene but Hitler autograph in the diary when you don't know what's going to happen is really 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 smart yeah. and well done good moment what, uh, Harrison Ford and Connery be- we covered a lot of the other ones yeah I mean like off that I, I love uh, Harrison Ford's fake Scottish accent right before he meets actual Scotsman Sean Connery yeah uh, I'm, we're here to see the tapestries um, and I love uh, when you watch this movie this stuff and it's probably the Lucas part all these like little rabbit holes you can go down of like the Chronicles of St. An- Anselm, which is like kind of true, but it's basically like the Canterbury Bishop who was like, here's where the grail is and the bro- brothers of the cruciform stored or, or the Knights Templar. And yeah, just it's like a fun movie to like study. I thought J- Julian Glover aged really well here. Like he, this is about to be Grand Maester Pycelle from Game of Thrones. Walter Donovan? Yes, yeah. 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 Um, hmm. And is it kind of a great heel figure in movies over the course yeah. of 40 years and his turn in this movie is perfect you think he's on one side and then there's a classic he's supposed to be what, like reverse. a getty kind of like, I guess so yeah. yeah the Kid Cudi Pursuit of Happiness Award for Best Needle Drop also wins the Great Shot Gordo Award for Most Cinematic Shot the final shot when the oh, yeah. indie there's music no, kicks no in and we get the sunset it's fucking the horizon you, love it you go Steve yeah. do your thing John just like you're one stuff. of the greats yeah it's a good one Big Kahuna Burger Award for best use of food and drink. Not a lot of eating or drinking. I got to tell you something. I just rewatched, you know, I skimmed through it, so I'm willing to be wrong. I don't think a single morsel of food is consumed in this film. Mm. No. 
Nobody goes to the bathroom. And they're in drinks. Venice, too. They yeah. missed out big time. That's why they needed the father-son eating scene. I have the grail as the best use of food and drink because it's water. Uh, a cup of Christ. Yeah. yeah. Mm. First time the cup of Christ might have won that one, I think. <laughs> That's right. First time. <laughs> First yeah. time winner. Yeah. Probably not the last. <laughs> the Den of Thieves Benihana Award for scene-stealing location. What would you go with, CR? Blimp restaurant. We got to bring blimps back. This is something that I'm passionate about. I, I just took like five flights in two weeks. And I want to I want to fucking get up and and mingle a little bit. Yep. Like I'm tired of being locked. You want to have the same experience but over several days <laughs> rather than 8 hours. <laughs> I've been looking into whether blimps are coming back cuz I think the Hindenburg may have uh you know like brought that down a yeah, bit. Yeah, burned the market a little. And there's a a company launching in 2026 that's offering Arctic and African voyages and I think we should do a live rewatchables on one of those. So I had this as one of my three possible hottest takes. I ended up doing a whole bunch of research on blimps. Yeah. Okay. Why did they fall out of fashion? <laughs> they were going really strong through yeah. like the mid fifties and then not sure what happened. This is leading... now that it's just like for TV, it's the Goodyear blimp. It's floating over the game. If, and that's like, all it is. If you were going from LA to Chicago and it was like, you can get there in five hours or you can get there in what a day and a half well how long is, how fast does blimp go <laughs> that's yeah no keep going no one's doing that <laughs> how, how long is how, but like i'm saying like but the option was you could just hang out in this restaurant yep. while you flew yeah you can also risk being burned alive inside of a balloon so that's oh because plane travel is just like 100 out of 100 <laughs> this right, is going right, to chris <laughs> chris a blimp on average can travel 150 to 200 miles per day that's horrible per oh. day. That's like way worse than cars. Oh, <laughs> like LA to San Diego. <laughs> this is going to lead directly to, I'm Sean Fennessy. Welcome to the Rewatchables. Unfortunately, Bill Simmons and Chris Ryan died tragically <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. in a blimp. <laughs> doing, Reco recording the five heat. Yeah, doing public enemies. <laughs> See, I'll do my blimp take now. I think the Hindenburg thing really scared people off. Yeah, I do think that happened. It, 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 was, <laughs> it was the worst. It was the worst and you know of all, else the, I fucking all the ways for this? to die. It was like, you're going to fall slowly to your death and then everyone gets set <laughs> on fire. That, people are like, whoa, blimps. I out. think people were ready to forget it and Led Zeppelin brought it back. No. And then stole the it's Zeppelin called thing. Led Zeppelin. No, but they brought it like by like having the Hindenburg on the album cover. People were like, oh yeah, blimps. Why did we ever think that was a good idea? Oh, they brought back the idea of hating them. Yeah, yeah I think oh, blimps I were okay. ready for a revival. And then sporting events. But if they made blimps that went like 300 miles an hour it'd be like oh do you want to go to san francisco with me we'll take the blimp and, oh god we'll have a Can nice lunch we'll time it for two playoff games i i wish you guys well i mean the idea of getting ten thousand feet in the air and going slow is not something i'm interested in <laughs> <laughs> what if there's movie theaters <laughs> yeah I'm what sure. if there's a movie theater yeah, sure what if it was a floating film festival sean's in the screening yeah. room on our blimp yeah i'll take a lot the of xanax and then i'll watch movies for 16 consecutive days I'm telling you, if if it hadn't been such a fiery, awful crash, it was like an unusually horrible crash. Yeah. People are like blimps. If it was just like out. a soft landing, you know, like, oh, no, it went down. Did, I'm sorry. Did, did Big Blimp cut you guys <laughs> a check? What is happening here? 150 <laughs> miles an hour. You know that blimps don't need like a runway so they can land in all sorts of Oh, how exciting. Places. They yeah. can also crash anywhere. So 150 miles a day. Yeah. <laughs> is that, but are those I mean, Hindenburg like, numbers or is that the newfound technology? I don't know. That's pretty tough. That's, that's we gotta sucks. work on blimps. I we feel like I do back. 150 miles a day going to like downtown Los Angeles. <laughs> that's incredible. That's bit. like a Zoe soccer trip. The, for yeah, me. the Hindenburg <laughs> could travel at 84 miles per hour. So they've only gone up 15 miles from that. <laughs> what the fuck was fun about going 84 miles an hour? I guess it was in the 1930s. Yeah, that must have been mind blowing. And that was the really max speed. The cruising speed 78. Well, I wish you guys well. <laughs> Titanic, people rallied back from giant yachts after the Titanic. Mm -hmm. They were like, all right, let's give this another whirl. Yep. Boats. Yep. I'm Lamp a fan style. of uh, commercial air travel. It's something I've been, I, I'm good with. I feel like we did, we're doing a good I'm job. Just, all I was saying was that it would be cool. Okay. It would be cool if planes also had like a restaurant then. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. yeah I, so I like, we need basically that's a multi-tiered planes. Yeah. Why, well, like in Midnight Run where it's just like going up the stairs and then there's like all this room and yeah. they're hanging out. Like, what happened to the double-decker planes? I took a double-decker plane to Europe recently. It was fine. It was nice. And what happened in the Concorde? I don't know. You got to bring was like, Let's back. try to get 800 miles an hour. From you got to you got to bring back big brick cell phones yeah. and and Concords. I in Midnight Run when they fly in the plane yeah. and they're in this awesome plane that has like a staircase. Yeah, you I'm get like, a little, oh man. Yeah. I get the steak, you get great. the lobster, a little surf and turf. 
Also, you gotta you gotta bring back a world where you can make a phone call on a plane where you say, "I'm talking to a dead man." Like, there's this. <laughs> What'd you have for Den of Thieves, Benny Hanna, where for scene steel and location? I had the Blimp restaurant. What'd you have? I th- where do they where are they they when Indy and his dad are like sort of seated together after they've escaped Austria but in the ha- Blimp restaurant. Is no no no. They're it's it's not it's they're they're in like Oh, um, in a motorcycle with the sidecar? No, no, no. It's before that sequence. They're like seated together and they're having an argument. I think it's after they've broken free, but before they go to Germany, before they go, where they go, Berlin. Where they go to Berlin, Before yeah. they go to Berlin, where are they? Austria. They're basically having an argument, and it looks like they're about to, like, have a coffee, but they don't. They're in Austria at the castle, then they, they run away, and then they go to Berlin. They take the motorcycle to Berlin. Mm-hmm. Then they get in a blimp to go, and then right. we can discuss where they go. Then an Uber. Yeah. <laughs> um... <laughs> I like when uh, they pop out of the manhole cover <laughs> yeah. and they're in the middle of like a, the talented Mr. Ripley yeah. all of a sudden. Yeah. Yeah. I like those yeah. big, giant, like people having coffee with lots of tables out in a yeah. big public area. The Butch's Girlfriend Award for Weak Link of the Film. I'm going to have to go with Allison Duty here, who's fine. I think she's too young. We covered that earlier. She was 21 when she made the movie, and Connery's like in his mid 50s, and Harrison Ford was in his mid 40s. Um, I just think there were better choices back then, and I have some for. I don't know if there's couch. a deep bench of believable Austrian women. Oh, I have a couple. For okay, me. I have a strong take about this, which yeah, is that it. I think that Marion should be in all of these movies, and that Karen Allen brings something to the movies that they're sometimes missing. Hmm. And her Are you trying out for one. Undisputed? Like, what's going on with you? There's the, the grail doesn't matter. Marion's got to be in all these movies. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's called uh, podcasting. <laughs> Get some takes going. No, I think she's great. And I think the ones that she's in are elevated by her presence. And uh, there's like a toughness in that character that these other characters don't have. No, no offense to Steven Spielberg's wife, Kate Capshaw, but like... That's kind of the weak link of Temple of Doom for me. Um, and this movie, too. It's like, Alison Duty is just not memorable. She's beautiful. She's not bad as an actress. I think her IMDb spoke for itself the next 35 years. I had a couple of recast. I'll do recasting couch now. Greta Scotch- Scotchy was in mm. this guy. You're she the, presumed innocent she? a year Absolute later. Absolute man for digging in for the Greta the Greta. Presumed dad. innocent a year later when she was kind of like underused in general, like... Um, Big talking point with me and my high school friends. We just loved her. Mm-hmm. She's um, Italian, right? She was just the best. I don't know. I think she's Italian. She's she, Italian Australian. She was. Mm. Yeah. There you go. How does she feel about blimp travel? <laughs> I think you put her in there. I wish we could have just switched her with Alice and Duty and Presumed Innocent. Oh, just do a, do a movie switch. You want Duty and Presumed yeah, Innocent? Just, I I think Greta Scott. She was underused and Presumed Innocent. She's barely in it. Wow. I don't think I've ever. Seen you pull off a one to for one trade that I might made get sense some in a picks. movie. Wow. Uh, Sharon Stone is throwing 120 miles an hour in 1989 and was available this and was in a whole bunch of movies right. like, like this. Before Total Recall. Yeah. She would have had to fake the she accent. She was in like King Solomon, which is essentially a yeah. very similar. Total yeah. Recall a year later, but I think maybe you just make her American and then uh, our queen, Michelle Pfeiffer. If you um, really want to get ballsy. Yeah. This is Fabulous Baker Boys. Mm, literally this Pfeiffer. year, wasn't it yeah. this year? Yeah. Did she ever make a Harrison Ford movie? She, what Lies Beneath? Yeah. Yeah. That's Good movie. Right. My thing is like, if you're going to get Harrison Ford, you're going to get Sean Connery. Don't don't go with the veteran's minimum as my point guard. <laughs> so you're up against go, the second apron. Go get me one more all-star. We have we yeah. have no second apron yeah. in the movie. We're yeah. about to make $500 million. Yeah. Go get me Sharon Stone. Go get me Greta Scotchy. Yeah. The Suns can't re-sign campaign for the same reason. You know, right. we need to bring in who? DeJounte Murray. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go get him. Like even Denholm Elliott is in this and he's probably way overqualified. Overqualified to be sure. this kind of dopey part totally. that he's in. They actually changed this character completely to make him more goofy for yeah. the first film. What stage the worst? Indy tries the Irish accent. Do you have any? Scottish. Uh, Scottish. Yeah. Do you, what, what do you got? What do you got for that one? I mean, I think it's supposed to be a joke. Okay. Yeah. A joke on Sean Connery. Or just a joke about his inability to, like, do Scottish accents, yeah. We basically mentioned everything. The 12 years apart, the uh, special effects. There was a part in the Premier Magazine that was also in the research about, um, it was pretty hot sometimes, and Connery was wearing these tweed pants, and anytime his bottom half was out of camera, 
he would just stroll around the set without pants and people thought it was hilarious. Yep. And now he would probably be arrested and thrown in jail. <laughs> it's funny. People don't realize that every time we film one of these, Chris has never worn pants. <laughs> Chris never wore his pants ever. Uh... It's like, oh, I remember when Sean had no pants on and was doing chicken Scottish, whatever. And, and, uh, what a in fun guy. In 1989, it's uh, hilarious. I know. <laughs> You're like, oh man, that Connery. <laughs> yeah. Any other would say the worst for you guys? Um, the flight that they take to get to Venice, three layovers, that's tough. And any time when they show the map mm. and all the f stops that 1930s planes had to make, where you're like, man, this thing just barely made it to Newfoundland. And then it had to stop in like the Azores, and then it had to stop like again in Lisbon. Like, it's tough. That was a for weird... For your beloved air, air travel. Weird era for maps and movies where they these movies would be like the top of the line people all over the place. Yeah. The best score. And then they'll be like, oh, we need a map sequence. And we get, Bob knows how to do a map. <laughs> <laughs> Bob's like making a map. It's like, yeah, who's Spielberg's is map it guy? Austria above Germany? And he's just <laughs> getting that going with a red line. And they just kind of shove that in. Also, I would just say, um, after watching John Wick 4, uh, it's kind of hard to go back to like a long fist fight. You know, good point. Um, what's up with the order of the cruciform sword? I feel like that hasn't aged well. Why not? Because like, what are those? That's the Soho house. Like what those guys? <laughs> <laughs> That's, it's That's just how people you get into the Soho house. You're like, yeah. <laughs> um, th so there's a band of secret, a secret cabal of yeah. soldier warriors who are protecting. The secrecy of the grail. The grail. Yeah, from guys like him. Is it They've more unlikely than grail. John Wick, the ho the homeless assassins that are strewn around the subway system? Well, very similar, actually. But what I, th th it's kind of tossed off. But like, what's so these guys have they're never the Knights Templar? But they've the never seen. They the grail. guard the security. Well, because you have to be like of a certain like purity of of like soul to do it. You know. But they've dedicated their lives to that. They're willing to die by propeller uh -huh. to keep Indiana Jones from getting to this thing that they've never seen. Again, I, I ask think they're you, trying to the keep grail. Are everybody sure it's good? trying to keep everyone from the grail to keep the grail secret because in the wrong hands, the grail's power is too big, you know? Eh, it just seems like a, a big sacrifice, you know? Show me. Show me something. <laughs> Show me a grail. I don't know. <laughs> who are these guys? We'll What's be back. Who is that guy? We'll be back on Rogan after this. <laughs> With heretic Sean, who's like, yeah, why would you care about God? <laughs> <laughs> do you want to debate somebody about the Holy Grail for $100,000? <laughs> I do. I bring Stephen A. in. I'm ready to speak with him. <laughs> uh, Chris, was there a better title for this movie? Indiana Jones and the Holy Grail. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think they didn't use Holy Grail? Well, because it's crusades to find the Grail and to go to reclaim the Holy Land. I so. think they didn't want it to be too defined by a, a Christian ethos, and that would have wouldn't have played as well overseas. Honestly, I don't love the title, and I don't know what the title should have been, but I don't love the title. Indiana Jones and his. I dad. always call this the third indie with Sean Connery. Like I don't even the title. I don't know. Yeah, um, it's also a prequel, so maybe they could have gotten a little inventive with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they should have just called it Indiana Jones' dad. <laughs> that would have been good. Indiana Junior and Senior. Yeah. Yeah. They should just title it like a Friends episode. The, the <laughs> one with Sean Connery. <laughs> <laughs> Best quote: "You lost today, kid, but that doesn't mean you have to like it." Good That's one. That's good. I one. Like that. yeah. My hottest take. Wait, can I just say I remembered my Charlemagne is my favorite quote. You know, oh. May my armies be. The birds and the trees and the right and the rocks. No, yeah, you're 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 mad. You're like, I'm not mad. I'm I just... in on blimps and I'm in on the grill, <laughs> and you have offended me. <laughs> All right, Stephen A. Smith, how does take a word? I just think the River Phoenix prequel. I just wish that had happened in 1989, and then we did this movie like in 1991. So they had already done Young Indiana Jones, the TV series, right? No, that was 92. Right 92. Yeah. It was inspired by okay. this movie. Yeah. And they tried to get River, and River wouldn't do and it. And by the way, if we're playing GM for a day with the franchise, the young Indiana Jones is probably the second movie. Mm. And yeah. then you do the the prequel. Well, interestingly, Temple Last of Crusade Doom is, the is third a movie. prequel. Because mm -hmm. Tem Temple of Doom takes place before the events of Raiders, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. Does Crusade take place it's right after? At, it's shortly after yeah. Raiders. Yeah. Are you eliminate? Would you... If I could trade you Temple of Doom for an entire Indiana Jones prequel with River Phoenix... A film or oh, a series? Film. You're wheeling and dealing right now. Yeah, it really yeah. must be draft week. Jeez. I just feel like that was like a that would have been an awesome it movie. It would have broken 
the hegemony of the series. Like it wouldn't, I think they would, you'd have to make that in a different way than you would make an Indiana, like a normal Indiana Jones series. Well, it's interesting because the, the whole series is obsessed with the idea of legacy. Like the fourth yeah. film is also his son, Mutt, and then the fifth film is his goddaughter and, you know, the Phoebe Waller-Bridge character. So mm-hmm. I think it, I, w- I would have been interested for sure. I, Temple of Doom, I'm not, I'm just not a big fan of personally. If we had the streaming era the way we had it, so they do the Young Indiana Jones show, but it's, I don't even know what channel that was on. Um, ABC, but now it would have been like, I think? it would have been like an Amazon or an Apple show. It would have been a Disney Plus show now. Or Disney Plus. Yeah. And it probably would have been awesome. They would have thrown money behind it. I don't know. Casting what ifs. We mentioned the Harrison Ford River Phoenix connection. So apparently if Connery said no, Gregory Peck and John Pertwee were the backup choices. I don't know who John Pertwee is. Who is that? John Pertwee? Uh, I just I knew know. about Peck. And then Amanda Redman was asked to play the female lead of Elsa, but turned it down because she had a real life fear of rats. Much like, I think, all humans. Mm. <laughs> but I mean, who's like, you know what I like? Rats. <laughs> Who do you have for the uh, Ru- Ruffalo, Hannah, Rubinick, Partridge overacting award, Sean? Anyone um, dial it up for you? Yeah. Uh, Michael Byrne as Ernst Vogel, the SS officer, really working extremely hard in this movie. I thought that the the Nazi lady in the castle who, when they first turn around in the fireplace and she's like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> she has like four seconds of screen time. She screams the entire time. Um, That's a good one. I also think any, all movies that John Reese davies are in are overacting awards because <laughs> yeah. it was like, Indy, Indy, come on down here, sir. Like there's no other way of delivering lines other than at the top of his register and very excited about who he's seeing. Like he's never That's given a, a subtle call. performance. Oh, the only other I'm casting what if, fan. by the way, Olivier was considered for the Grail Knight, but he, he passed away. Ah. Yeah. yeah. Probably died just the thinking, Holy of, Grail on him. thinking of dealing with the Grail and all that bullshit. <laughs> 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 Best that guy award? I think Allison Duty probably wins it, right? Every time you saw her, it was like, oh, the lady yeah. from any, if she was in anything after this, it was the last crusade lady. Yeah. She never really had another thing. You know what she did have? What? Major League Two. Oh, wow. Right. Oh, that's Is she the good. owner? No, she's the girl. She's yeah. Behringer's girlfriend who yes. he leaves for Rene Russo. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Rebecca Flannery. Holy shit. And then she stole his bat. <laughs> um, Deanne Waiters Award? I don't know. I got the Grail Knight. Okay. That's good. There's a good story about that guy, right? What's that actor's name? I can't remember. Uh, that guy's name is Robert Edison. Robert, who he's like a world class stage actor who had, who had acted in a movie in 1948 and had not acted on screen since then. Wow! And they brought him in for this film. That's just this one. He sequence, just knocks it out and he kills it. Yeah. And Choose Wisely has lived on forever. Yeah, it's a kind of a meme now. Is mm. it? it is you that have, image you have chosen? Yeah. poorly. <laughs> I haven't seen that. Yeah. Well, so Harrison Ford did many of his own stunts, which he always does. And there's a lot of quotes in there about the stuntman being like, if he wasn't such a great actor, he would have been an awesome stuntman. I love when they say that about yeah. like Cruz or Harrison He's, Ford. That's the physical version of the guy who smoked a cigar and drank two whiskeys every day and lived till 96, but it's Harrison Ford and he's just thrown his body off of trucks for the last 50 yeah. years and he's going to live till he's 90. Right. It's yeah. kind of amazing. This is kind of a bummer. Denholm El- Elliott was diagnosed with AIDS shortly before filming began and was seriously ill during some of the production stuff. and. I don't think lasted a lot that long after. I think he died in 92, yeah. Um, most of the uniforms w- worn by the Nazis are authentic World War II uniforms, not replicas. They found some case in Germany, the costume designer decided to use them. So they bred the rats for yeah. the movie. 2,000 rats, somewhere 2,000 or 7,000. I saw different numbers, but you had to breed them so they didn't have disease. Couldn't do it. I just couldn't be a part of it. Personally, yeah. you, is rats at the top just, of your fear like power rankings? And I, I don't like the idea of five thousand of them being like in the building with me. Rats, snakes, bugs. What's your ranking there? Those are the three creatures, in like the, most in the first three of. films, from most to least. I would say snakes. Like you can kick rats, mm. but snakes are just. I don't like know. the idea of being like a rat, like rat infestation. What about you? I'm, I don't. I don't like bugs. I'm kind of scared of bugs. Not just like a bug, like a single spider, no problem. At 25 plus bugs in any circumstance? Yeah. Not good. Terrified. My daughter is really scared of spiders. It's really strange. <laughs> you like know, one you, spider's like, ah, 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 it's like turns into that. 
the following year after Last Crusade, Steven Spielberg produces his good friend Frank Marshall's directorial debut. Yeah. Arachnophobia. Yeah. Arachnophobia. Wow. Um, Michael Jackson visited the set during his bad concert tour. And in the controversial HBO documentary, Leaving Neverland, it was revealed he was brought a child actor with him who then had a bunch of claims, but said that he hung out with Harrison Ford and got to swing his bullwhip. So that's on the internet. Jesus. Um, what do you think the body count was in this movie? Uh, well, I would probably say like in 25, 30. What do you got, Sean? 40? 50. Yeah. Okay. 13 from Indy. Ooh. This is weird. River Phoenix and Sean Connery both died on Halloween. River Phoenix in 1993 and Sean Connery in 2020. Sean Connery outlived River Phoenix by 27 years. Mm. That that Sad. was disturbing. Apex Mountain. Harrison Ford. I mean, oh, obviously other, not. One of their half ass internet research yeah. is just that Tom Stoppard, the famous playwright, did a lot of, uh, did some work on the script and I think did a little, a lot of the dialogue between Connery and Ford. Huh. So I I read and I don't know if this was erroneous, but I read that Spielberg credited him credited him with almost all of the dialogue. All, all, Stoppard. Stoppard. Yeah. Uh, well, there's actually not that many dialogue scenes, so that's not I, the but, ones that there are are quite good. But that's when you look back, especially the stuff between Indy and Henry. When he's like, "You left home just when you were getting interesting." Yeah, like some of that stuff yeah. is really sharp. Yeah, mm. and it does feel like the hand of a great writer. Not that Jeffrey Bohm isn't a great writer, or anybody else who contributed, but feels elevated. Apex Mountain, Harrison Ford, no. I do th I think that he's a second Apex guy, though. Second Apex? Yeah, like some guys had such a great career. Are you going to introduce like second Apex Mountain? Oh, there's like a second as Apex. <laughs> okay. We've talked about it before. What some is that like when you come down the mountain and then you reascend, or is it a new mountain? You were up the mountain, but then you got older and people were like, he doesn't have it anymore. And then there's like this other Apex. Well, I'll tell you what, this is the second Apex Mountain for the Holy Grail itself. <laughs> number apex yeah. mountains obviously catching the yeah. blood of christ yeah but this is the second apex yeah and it would be the second this podcast would be the second apex <laughs> for blimps if we could only get them back up in the air but <laughs> no big aviation won't allow it how about rats and snakes in a movie uh well i would say anaconda i agree anaconda is kind probably of snake apex one. For but snakes. rats i mean like th does it get any better than this i don't know first blood's got some good rat stuff uh, yeah. oh, that's good I do enjoy where it's, it's a, you know, close up on Indy and Allison Duty, and he's like, rats! And then it pans down yeah. and you actually see rats. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say this. It's a little bit of a confession. If I was in a cave like this, like Rambo and First Blood or these guys in this movie, I just would be way more scared. Like, I'm basically holding my cigarette lighter. <laughs> I'm just walking down this dark body mm -hmm. of fucking cave water. It's like nothing good. Every step, you're yeah. like, what am I stepping on? I just would be way more unconfident. Well, he's gone through so many adventures, I think, by this point. He's become a little bit used to being in the catacombs, you know? Yeah, I mean, you're not Indiana Jones, right? That's and why he's I. one of the greats. <laughs> <laughs> Sean Connery, No. <laughs> Spielberg and Lucas, no. Alice and Duty, yes. Zeppelins. N -n -n. Eh, probably him. No, I think... Yeah, Apex or, Mountain? Apex Valley. Mm -hmm. I, I know, well, it's I Black Sunday. Just being named... Black Sunday's good. Yeah. You know, Led Zeppelin, I think, would probably also be like a big one for them. How about Chopped Off Rolling Heads? Um, No. There's been better, but I couldn't I mean, think of eight one. Eight Heads in a Duffel Bag. That's a big one. <laughs> you guys seen that one? Nazi Stooges? There's some. These are really good Stooges. I I prefer the Stooges uh, in Raiders. Yeah, taught in Raiders is he's great. The Holy Grail. I I think it's 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 second place to the, the last day, the, day the last the, supper and the crucifixion. Yeah. Yeah. So you believe those events occurred? <laughs> so you put this over Python? Oh, good question. For me, yes. Okay. Just like in my own personal you know, Python, put it in the title. Much prefer Python. Yeah. Best racehorse name. Oh wait, I got one more. What's age? Uh, sorry, one more. Apex. Apex. What do you got? This sort of this is a debate. So when Indy first meets Walter Donovan, he's having a black tie party in the middle of the day. Ah. And is this the second best black tie party in the middle of the day next to Pulp Fiction? Next oh, to Winston Wolf. The Wolf. Yeah. Here's what we don't know: is 
anyone else wearing a tuxedo at the Winston <laughs> Wolf party, or is that just how the wolf? No, there's dresses? a shot you can see people wearing, wearing them in, black in Pulp okay, Fiction. Okay. Yeah, but um, guys, don't step on the last podcast in the history of this feed. <laughs> Pulp Fiction. <laughs> The blimp pod? Yeah. Uh, Pulp Fiction in a blimp. With that's Sean. a great take, like though. If, even if I got fired, I was like, wait, before I get fired, can I just can we rip off the Pulp Fiction pod? And can I just sneak it almost famous? Uh, uh, don't put us in that position, Yeah, Bill. sorry, guys. Um, yeah, I, that's a... You've never been to a midday tuxedo Black tie party? Yeah. I haven't either. I'm just asking. You probably have. Come on. I I had it stumbled into like a 4.30 in the morning Vegas situation once that was like, what's going on here? But you never went to like 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 an awards luncheon at 11 a.m. where you did. The Peabody Awards were like that, but it wasn't like tuxedo. Okay. You haven't been to the Peabody's clearly. I haven't, no. But I have been to some some Vegas events like that. How many times has The Watch been nominated for Peabody? (laughs) What was that face? It's going to be for the idol when we bring back the idol, when we turn the discourse around. I had one of my friends compared it to Showgirls today. I'm like, you guys don't see it. <laughs> <laughs> this is not Elizabeth Berkeley. Best racehorse name? Crusade? Last Crusade? Something with Crusade? I think Cup of Christ is a really good horse name. <laughs> You want to get the word Christ into yeah, a racehorse's name? Yeah, why not? What's wrong with that? That, that horse is going to end up dead. He how resurrects. About, <laughs> how about Zeppelin Rising? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Let's go with that. Picking okay. nits. X marks the spot is the name of the horse. Hmm. Picking nits. Indy. A little more dubious of Elsa, maybe. In retrospect, we're going to pick some nits on Indy. Just really had a hard maybe, on. Uh, Guy loves blondes. Maybe keep your guard up a tiny bit. Yeah. With the After being told not Austrian. to trust anyone. Yeah. yeah. It's a flaw. What's the... She, they've got that great exchange right at the beginning when they first encounter. And he's like, you got your father's eyes and your mother's ears. And but the rest is all yours. The rest yeah. is all yours. That's just an amazing it belongs moment. to you. Yeah. Harrison Ford is a very good... Kind of like stealth horny actor. Flirt actor. Like horny flirt guy, yeah. but not, it's never creepy. Yeah. No, he doesn't. What other picking nits do you have? We covered everything else. Um, I think that there's, just personally, like there's a lot of small print, a lot of fine print on the Holy Grail, you know, where it's like, you can't take it beyond the seal. Mm-hmm. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't work over here. It Making doesn't work my over case there. for me here. Thank you. So I would just say within the depiction of this film, it seems like they put a lot of conditions on the power of the Grail. Doesn't doesn't none of it make sense? Like if the Nazis just went and got the Grail, the second you leave the area, it you're no longer able to live. Yeah, forever. and then the whole thing is Correct. like Donovan so, is like, I'll just use it for eternal life. The Nazis can have it for whatever they want. But the second Donovan walks out the door, he no longer has eternal life. Correct. Why does somebody even need to guard the Holy Grail if the second you leave, it's ineffective? This is I I was going right where you are, which is the inherent flaw of not just the mythology of the Grail, but of the way that it is told in this movie, which is how I understood it as like an eight year old when I first saw this movie. Is it is illogical? It uh, so is make the sense. only reason why the seal thing happens so that they don't then have to answer like why isn't Indy's dad alive forever? I think so. I think so. It just healed him, but it didn't keep him alive. It's forever. like Mad HBO with the second apron tax. <laughs> just where he's like, so if I go slightly over the second apron tax. <laughs> I can go forty million over, and it's the same penalty. I think I'm just going over. Right before the Beal trade, yeah. Isaiah Thomas watched Last Crusade, and he's like, "I've got it." Yeah. He's like, "Don't cross that line." Watch this. <laughs> Three pick swaps. Ishby is going to turn into a skeleton of dust, <laughs> like uh, like that guy. Uh, sequel, prequel, prestige TV, all black cast are untouchable. This movie checked four of the five boxes somehow. We did not see an all black cast Indiana Jones yet. Um, I feel like the order, like if you're watching these from scratch, you kind of have to start with this one, right? Well, and then you go to Raiders? No, you would do Temple, Temple of, Doom. of Doom, Raiders, this one. This what is, was Temple? I haven't seen Temple of Doom in a while. What, it's what like year is that? It's like 34. Yeah. So you go Temple of Doom, this one. No, Temple Ra- of Doom, Raiders, this one. Correct. That's the, That's chronological. the chronological order. And then Crystal Skull and then Dial of Destiny. Okay. Right? Yeah, I yeah. think so. I believe so. Right, Craig, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is this movie better with Wayne Jenkins, Danny Trejo, Catherine Hahn, Steve Buscemi, Sam Jackson, JT Walsh, or Philip Baker Hall? I do think that if Wayne Jenkins was the Grail Knight, 
it would be like, God damn, Indy! I didn't know I was waiting on the penitent man to bow up in this chamber. You know what? I've been here a long fucking time, big boy. Get Walter his cup of Christ and get him the fuck out of here. I don't know how I didn't see. I've been up in here a long fucking <laughs> time. Coming. That. I didn't see <laughs> Great stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Oh my Just want to ask her who are you giving it to, Wayne Jenkins? Yeah, um, Connery, supporting actor. I had Connery as well. Didn't Connery just win for Untouchables? Yeah, but like, what the hell? You know, just two in a row. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I got no beef with that. The Cup of Christ doesn't exist, but the Oscars—that's sacred. <laughs> we got to really respect tradition. <laughs> I think you know that's how I feel. The thing is, is I, I did. This was going to be sort of kind of be a hottest take. It's not really a hottest take because I've said something, some version of this before. But it's really dumb to me that when something like this comes along, it is not really in contention for real Oscars. That just because it's the third movie, yeah. and yeah. this has been somewhat uh, amended do it for by Lord of the Rings, and costume design, yeah, and stuff like that. It gets below the line stuff, but like this is legitimately one of the best movies of the year. So you would pull back Dan Aykroyd's Best Supporting Actor nomination for Driving Miss yes. Daisy. I mean, that's throw a, Connelly, Connery's way. This is and this is a car crash Oscars. This is Driving Miss Daisy wins and Do the Right Thing is nominated. Movies like this are nominated. I don't know. They're all bad, I guess. Whatever. Eighty nine is one of the worst ones because this also has Michelle Pfeiffer, our queen, mm -hmm. losing. For fabulous Baker Boys. Who'd she lose to? Oh, for to to Jessica, Jessica Tandy. Tandy yeah. And Drive Miss Daisy. Yeah. And we also have Jeff Bridges, who also should have been nominated for that movie, mm -hmm. not getting nominated at all. And then Spike, um, best screenplay. He did get nominated, but he lost to Dead Poets. I love Dead Poets. I don't know. That's tough. I mean, he should have just been nominated for best director. <laughs> he should have been nominated for best director is where we really went sideways. So it's just the same with Soderbergh. Jim Sheridan, my left foot. Kenneth Branagh, Henry V. Peter Weir, Dead Poets. Woody Allen, Crimes and Misdemeanors. As you know, my favorite Woody Allen movie. Yeah. It's very good. Oliver movie. Stone, Born on the Fourth of July, mm -hmm. wins it. Love that movie. Yeah. Pretty good year. Could have snuck Spike in there, I think. You say, keep driving Miss Daisy in place. Yeah. <laughs> keep driving Miss Daisy in place. The Grail is good. Blimps are better. Remember that scene when he was driving her? <laughs> <laughs> um, Probably unanswerable questions. We talked Holy Grail, but I wrote down the Holy Grail. Is it like HGH? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> like some, <laughs> some athletes we've That's had in the, the past. the extent of it, yeah. Like if somebody all of a sudden had more home run power than mm -hmm. maybe they had in the past. Uh -huh. It was like Holy Grail-ish. Right, right. The, the Jeff Bagwell Cup, you know? <laughs> Here's a good one. I really want you guys to think about this and dissect it. Has anyone ever punched more guys in a movie than Harrison Ford? Oh yeah, who? Um, I mean, ja uh, Jackie Chan but or punch. Bruce Lee punch or like face normal or American guy punch, like those Harrison Ford punches, not like Rocky. I'm Balboa. doing kung fu. You know. No, no. I think I, Harrison I, Ford's I, punched I think the he's most. Punched the Chris most is, people. Chris is with me. I've thought about this a lot because, no. like, it's it's the primary I mean, Roadhouse, form of combat. Like, uh, he's, he there's a lot of like in, how many fights in Indiana? He never Jones? kicks anybody. I, I, it won't be us, but there's going to be somebody out there who's going to watch every American male fight sequence <laughs> ever filmed. Fight sequence is different than normal guys getting in a fight. Yeah, where he's just basically he's like the wrestler. His the Hulk Hogan leg drop is Harrison Ford's just only punching move. Punching a just, guy in the jaw. He just has the right cross. He has no other moves. He doesn't have. He doesn't have like a clothesline, a headlock. He doesn't put the. He doesn't kick hold. anyone. Yeah, it's just like right hand. Definition he is getting do more jabs. and more now. He doesn't it's DDT like, anyone. He's the only man born between 1939 <laughs> and 1942 in right Illinois on a Even Sunday. Even the fugitive, like the one arm guy, it's just always. These got are the kinds of conversations right. we could be having on the blimp, but yep. you don't want to be a part of it. I I don't actually. <laughs> I wish you guys well in the sky. Like the Harrison Ford scouting report. If you're a bad guy and you're like, hey, we might deal with Harrison. It would just be guard your you're face just, from the, you're just, from the yeah, punch. Yeah, you'd just be yeah. like, just duck under the right and come under body shot because that guy has no other moves. Yeah. It's believable because you, it looks like he's probably punched a guy before, right? How many how many guys in real life do you think Harrison Ford has Never punched? added a karate kick. You know, think yeah. at, at some point he had a personal trainer and he's like, hey, man, I just feel like I'm doing this. I've heard thing a lot about jiu-jitsu. Can I do yeah. a little of that? Is there some sort of, no. like, maybe would be like a Mark Zuckerberg thing. Maybe learn some judo. They're like, no, Harrison, you're good, man. Just right crosses. You're good. <laughs> Best double feature with this movie. 
I, I just think you pair it with Raiders and you're good to yeah, go, right? for sure. Yeah, don't overthink it. Andy and Red Zawatney Award for what happened the next day. What do you think happens to the Grail Knight? 700 years mm -hmm. waiting. Does he have the internet in there? What's he doing? <laughs> the Nazis. He gives a black And <laughs> Walter Donovan and Indy and his dad and Elsa come through. There's a real, they really just bumble the, the chain of possession there with the Grail. Mm -hmm. Grail gets lost. Right, and, it's and in your a temple crack collapses. In the earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, what do you think his kind of next day is? <laughs> I, I honestly think it's exactly the same as every other day. Does he not die? I think he gets like crushed by like the rubble. You yeah, know? I think he dies. No, but he doesn't cross the seal. But he pass. But doesn't he say like he gives the sword to Harris to Indiana Jones? But like, I think he I'm has to now? start his journey home, right? Like his brothers did. Oh, I thought he became mortal. Oh, he got a show on Hulu. <laughs> 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 celebrity interviews it's yeah. not that many it's like 10 a year yeah it's like kind of like modeled after the letter he really show. wants to talk to interesting people about yeah, what they're passionate he's, about yeah, yeah. and my successful next guest person is with another the grail night yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, who what, are your guys <laughs> <laughs> this one's easy what piece of memorabilia would you want from this movie the it's grail. gotta be the grill cup yeah. right that'd be the fucking coolest thing you could own but I would give fantasy the fake one just to see what happens <laughs> Like, the so I can burn alive? <laughs> yeah, I just feel like yeah. look, looks like you cho you chose poorly. That's gonna be Matt Ishbia. <laughs> now drink, <laughs> drink from the Bradley Beal trade, Matt Ishbia. Ah! <laughs> I thought we'd have more depth. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> what do you mean the second apron? <laughs> Told me we'd get a veteran point guard. Isaiah. <laughs> <laughs> Isaiah, didn't you read the CBA? <laughs> Uh, by the way, this metaphor makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Coach Finstock Award for Best Life Lesson. I mean, Elsa never really believed in the Grail. Saw it as a prize. Mm. What? You gotta chase what you believe in. <laughs> Let's. Can we just unpack her for one second? Elsa, what was really going on there? Was she in it? I think she was a nail. She was archaeologist, Nazi curious, right? <laughs> so she gets kind of pulled into. To that yeah. that whole thing, yeah, a phrase, not the first time you've said that phrase. I but think. is ultimately interested in history and okay. and you know like the power bestowed by great items. Okay, and then I think she just kind of like plays you know both sides. Great items is that a, is that a euphemism <laughs> you think, for Connery? You think an archaeologist, Raya, <laughs> <laughs> the guy in San Jose, yeah. has some, some potential. My name, my name's Elsa. I love wearing leather jackets. <laughs> I'm not so curious. I love, I love just wandering Venice. <laughs> so romantic. I'm into boats. Yeah. Rats, not a negative. Yeah. yeah. I love great jazz. <laughs> Who won the movie for you guys? Uh, so I actually think Harrison Ford won the movie. I think Steven Spielberg. I, this, is, this is probably... I think Harrison Ford as well. Hey, that's why he and I get it. That's why you guys are going to die in a blimp together. <laughs> <laughs> well, he... Star Wars wasn't necessarily a Harrison Ford vehicle. Raiders, then Temple Doom comes out and makes money, but people didn't like it, and every, everyone got mad at everybody. So mm -hmm. he kind of needed he needed this for the resume. I can make repeatable, awesome. Color levels. Purple, Empire of the Sun, always three in a row, three non-successes for him. This puts him back on track, I think. And then he basically is the absolute king for 20 consecutive years. From 1993 through... I don't know, 2012, he's, he's the king. <laughs>